Pastor Hanley, thank you for that introduction. Uh, pastors are supposed to tell the truth, though. And uh, if you think I'm a, one of the better preachers, then the answer is simply, you just need to meet more people, and uh, <laughs> that's fine. It is good to be here. I bring you greetings from Boston Chinese Evangelical Church, BCC, my elders and my pastors there, and uh, they know I'm in California, and I'm just texting some people, and so it's a joy to be here. Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the Old Testament Gospel of Exodus, the Old Testament book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, 33, as we look into that passage here. Now, I understand usually this church, all the services are preaching the same text, so I appreciate the, uh, uh, the graciousness of our hosts and pastors to kind of let us depart a little bit. Exodus chapter 33, would you turn there with me? Exodus chapter 33. I would like to read the text uh, in the ESV, is that? ESV is okay. Okay, in English Standard Version. If you don't have a Bible, you can just listen, probably listen to read off someone next to you, or download the app before I'm done talking. Exodus chapter 33, I would like to read the entire chapter, and then I would like to say a prayer for our time together. Again, it's a joy to be here. It's a great honor, and, but we're really here to see the Lord together. So Exodus chapter 33, it's in the beginning of the Bible, after Genesis. Exodus chapter 33, I'll read for us the whole chapter, and then I'd like to once again, open our time in prayer. So let's have open ears and open hearts to hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone to the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you my name. Verse 18, Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. 
Let's thank God. Let us pray together. Gracious Father, as we turn now to your word, uh, perhaps a word that we know well in the Old Testament, perhaps it's a word that this is our first time gazing upon this. It's got a lot of interesting, maybe even strange features of it, but this is about understanding your presence in our lives. So would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, illuminate us, convict us, teach us, encourage us, humble us, whatever we need so that we may be drawn closer to you and live the life you called us to. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I have been at my church since 2001. Some of the first wave of our teens in the youth group are pastor staff, are on pastoral staff with me, and a number of them are deacons and do things like set my salary and things like that. And over the years, I tell this now because when you have like a lot of couples to do weddings for, I can share a story, especially on the other side of the country, without getting into the details. One of the couples, was actually not really in our church, but had been in our church before. Um, And they're kind of coming back to the faith, and they were talking to me about their premarital counseling. So my premarital counseling, I'm like the pastor that gives a lot of homework. So we have six, we used to have six, now it's more like eight or ten sessions of two hours each. There's a lot of reading, there's a lot of assessments, and there's a lot of stuff, and it's just really good to get to know the couples. And so this couple had a particular concern. Their concern was how to pay for the wedding, because, you know, Chinese-ish, Christian-ish wedding. And in weddings in New England, like, just, these are small affairs. Funerals in New England, small affairs. But a Chinese Christian wedding, you know, this is like one third of the wedding right here, right? So I'm just kidding. It's a little smaller, but, but it's a lot of people. And they're very concerned about the wedding because they had hopes for a nice wedding. And so this is sort of in the sessions. And we're about to close the session. They told me this. And so we talked about maybe ways they could bring it up. They expressed their concerns. And I listened to them. And, and we prayed. And I sent them off, knowing that in about a month, we'd come back and talk again. And they'd up me about the conversation with their parents. The reason why they're concerned about paying for the wedding was because they thought their parents might be upset about this. Why might the parents be upset about paying for the wedding? Because it turns out, before they came back to my church-ish, they had already gotten married. So they're going through this, but they're actually married, but they, they weren't living as husband and wife. But they went ahead and got married, sort of like immigration, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so they're there. So like, okay, I can see why you would be concerned that your parents might not want to pay for the wedding since they missed the last one. Okay, so, so they go. Next month, they come back, and we're praying. We're talking through some of the other stuff, and we get to the whole thing. Okay, like, I'm really curious, and how did the conversation go? And they're, they're, they look kind of sad. They're kind of heavy, and they say, well... Yeah, we told her parents, and um, yeah, I said, I'm being very patient, so, and they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, they, we, they, they learned about it. I said, okay, so what about, you were very concerned about them paying for the wedding. What did they say about paying for the wedding? And they said, oh, 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 uh, they, they will pay for the wedding. They said they'll pay for the wedding. And I'm like, I'm thinking, that's great, right? That was your big concern, that, but you don't look, so I said, That was your big concern, was it not? They said, yes. Your concern was that they were not going to pay for the wedding because you were already married without telling them, right? They're like, yes. So why are you so concerned? You don't look happy. What's the deal? They said, oh, well, Pastor Enoch, they said, they'll pay for the wedding. They just won't go to the wedding. And I think that story, true story as it is, depicts something in my life definitely in the life of my church, and perhaps you've seen it, perhaps you've even observed it, perhaps you've experienced it. And that is what it means to have a ministry of presence. So this is about experiencing God's presence. And this is one of the most strangest passages of the Old Testament. We've got like God saying, I'm going to put you in my back, and we've got Moses bargaining like a Chinese grandmother with God about things like, let me see you coming with us, all these sorts of things going on. But if we could talk about this entire passage, it really is about what it means to be in the presence of God. So let me offer, I'm going to go through this passage with three points as we guide us through this text. Three things I believe God's going to show us about God's presence, and they are these. Number one, we're going to consider this. Why is it we often feel like we don't have God's presence. Why is it, maybe you're a Christian and you go, why is it that if God is supposed to be with us, that we often don't feel like we have his presence? And maybe you're not a Christian or you're kind of in between or coming back or you're on a different place in your journey. And maybe this is something you're thinking about. Like, what, why is it that these churches say they're full of God's presence, but it just does not seem like it? Now, there might be a lot of answers to that question, but this passage is going to focus on one area of why is it that it does not feel like we have God's presence? 
Number two, as we consider this, we're going to also consider this idea. If that's, we understand why God doesn't seem to be near, we're going to talk about number two. How do we cultivate a greater experience of God's presence? What are the practices? What can we do in our lives? Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, how can we cultivate? What do we do to have a greater experience of God's presence in our lives? So point one, we're going to consider why is it we feel like sometimes that we don't have God's presence? Number two, how do we cultivate a greater experience of God's presence? And then number three, (laughs) what does it really feel like to experience God's presence? Like, 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 what is that? No, really, what is it like? How do I know if it's happening? How can I tell? What is it like to experience God's presence? And again, each of these things have points throughout the scriptures, but in this passage, I think there's a specific teaching for us. So why is it that sometimes we don't feel like we have God's presence? How do we cultivate and experience more of God's presence in our lives? And if all that were to happen, What is it like to actually experience God's presence? So first point, why is it, maybe you asked this question, maybe you haven't, but I definitely have, how come sometimes it feels like God's not here? God's not here in my life, in my family, or my church. Why is it that sometimes we don't experience God's presence? We go to the text, but let me give you, just as you read this passage, it's helpful to know this, that prior to this passage, Moses in the Old Testament, has already led the children of Israel out of captivity. They've had the tremendous episode of crossing the Red Sea, which is, if you don't know the story, it's just God powerfully and miraculously delivered his people from captivity and slavery, miraculously helped them cross a body of water, the Red Sea, and then, then after all that fantastic stuff, they turned away from God in the form of instead of worshiping the God who delivered them, they worshiped the statue of a golden cow, the golden calf. So if you have a little bit of church background, maybe some of you do, uh, that, that that's what just happened. And so God and Moses are talking in this scene. They've just kind of finished that. They, uh, Moses discovered the people of God are not worshiping God. They're worshiping a statue, a golden statue of God, and he's just so upset. And so now this is sort of that post-discipline thing, right, where, where Moses is like, God, don't, you know, like, don't, you know, be merciful. And God's like, you know, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do, having you disobeyed. Does that, that's the setup. So now look, Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to consider this. Take a look at verse 1 as we kind of get to this first point. Chapter 33, let me draw our attention there again. Verse 33 says this. Now the Lord, having the golden calf episode happened, the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to which the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people. Verse 4, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. Let's pause right there. What's happening? God's like, I am so... I am so upset with your disobedience and worship and turning away from me that here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you to the promised land. It's going to be such a fertile and rich land. It's like flowing with milk and honey, meaning the livestock, the animals are just so healthy and vigorous that like milk is flowing and like honey, the the fauna and the flora is just so rich. It's just flowing with natural resources. I'm going to give you all these things, but I'm not going to go with you. That's kind of interesting. What kinds of things is God promising to the people of Israel. He's saying, you're going to go and you're going to get success in military conquest. My angel will defeat the Amorites, Hittites, Jebusites, and Hivites. You're also going to go and you're going to be prosperous. You're going to have this socioeconomic uh, goodness. It's going to be great. You're going to prosper. You're going to flow. The only thing is, I won't go with you. So why is it that sometimes I do. Maybe you can relate. Why do I feel like, why is not God with me? Why don't I have God's presence? Here's my point. We sometimes feel like we don't have God's presence because we have mistaken God's blessings for his presence. Sometimes the reason we wonder, is God really here? Is because we're mistaken. We've confused God's blessings and good gifts with his presence. If this was a church and not the people of Israel, God would be like saying this, you know, I'm going to give FCBC Walnut a new building. 
going to give you great offering numbers. I'm going to even have people come to Christ, and it's going to be amazing. You're going to have incredible times of worship and convicting times of preaching. The food will be great. It's going to be all those things. I just won't be there. And if you listen to my prayer requests and the prayers that I sometimes make with people in my church, we're asking God for everything. God, bring people. God, help us do this. A lot of doctors all over the world get wisdom. Like, that's the thing. Give the doctors wisdom. We're asking for all this stuff, but the basic idea here is maybe we're asking for all this stuff, but we're not asking for the most important thing. God, will you give this church, will you give this family, will you give this person a greater sense of your presence? But if blessings are how I read God, then where's God? Where is God when life is hard? Where, where is God? Because we're struggling financially. We're, we're, where is God? Because, I don't know, we're not as popular. We're not beloved in the community. Where is God? We have mistaken God's blessings for his presence. My parents happen to live in Southern California. So, you know, it wasn't the hardest ask to kind of stay a little bit, few more days. So I'm outing you, Pastor Hanley. So at Lord willing, after this, I'm going to see my parents. They, they live in Rancho Palos Verdes. So oh, some of you are like, oh, some of you, wow, some of you are judging me. And um, <laughs> when I grew up there, it's very different. But, uh, but basically, if you know me, living in New England, which is comparable to living in Seattle, Manhattan, San Francisco, and parts, you know, California, right here, it's just really expensive. So relative to our income net worth ability, to my parents who live in Rancho Paul's Verdes. When it comes to Christmas and holidays, anniversaries, I realized a long time ago, there's pretty much nothing I can give them. There's no gift I can buy. There's no gift card I can give. It's just, it's almost, it's almost laughable. They still give us way more stuff than we could ever give them. But there's one thing I figured out a long time ago that would make them really happy. Costco calendars <laughs> with pictures of their grandchildren. Nothing else makes them happier than seeing their grandchildren, and maybe me and my wife, and, and nothing else makes them happier in this way than when we go. This is the season of our life for the last 20 years since we've lived in Boston, and our kids grew up in Boston, no grandparents around. They're all in Southern California. If God allows us to make it the gift of, to us and to our family, to our parents, is to bring our family to just basically spend time with my parents, my wife's mom, uh, and they're pushing their 80s, so however long the Lord gives us together. Because more than any gift that I could ever give, presence is the sweetest and most valuable thing. As I consider my life and the times I've wondered if God is with me, if I wonder if God is listening to me, if I wonder whether God is there, I have to admit, maybe, maybe you guys are more mature, but I, I have to admit it's because I wondered, come on, God, I, you're not giving me the thing I wanted, the, the people I'd like to meet, the stuff I want to get, the events and circumstances that I hope to happen. And what God is saying is, you know what? You just, you're not asking for the right thing. Israel had disobeyed God by worshiping a golden statue. He, they worshiped the created thing instead of the creator. And God was so incensed in his discipline that he was going to punish them by blessing them and sending them away. And that's why Moses says, no, 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 no. He literally says this, what distinguishes me and your people from all the peoples of the earth if it's not you with us? It's the people of God with the presence of God. That's what makes it the people of God. So my friends, something to consider. And this is, again, there's probably other reasons this happens too, but in this passage, one of the reasons Sometimes we feel like God's presence is not there because he's not answering the things we're asking for is because we confuse or mistake God's blessings with his presence. Well, if that's true, if we sometimes can confuse and mistake God's blessings for his presence, what do we do about that? How can we cultivate in our daily lives a greater experience of God's true presence. And now we come to this passage and we're going to see again. So Moses has just said, no, 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 no. Please, God, please, anything but bless us without your presence. And so we're going to see two strange things. There's going to be like this ornament thing, taking off the ornaments. We'll unpack that a little bit. And then there's this very odd account of the tent of meeting where God comes down and they watch 
They watched the, the glory of the Lord come down in a cloud to descend upon the tent of Moses' meeting. So there's two things we're going to see, two principles that talk about what we can do today to cultivate a greater experience of God's presence. So let's take a look here. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Verse 4. Join me there. When the people heard this disastrous word of God's blessings without his presence, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. It's the anger, righteous anger of God. So now, here's what you're going to do. Take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward, or Mount Sinai. That's really important later with Elijah, but that's another sermon. Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. So here's what they're saying. God, they're like, wait, you're going to bless us without your presence? Anything but that, God. God's like, I, if I were to go with you, I would consume you. No, God, what can we do? God says, take off your ornaments. What's going on here? Well, there was a practice there back then, and there's a couple of interpretations here. One interpretation is that sometimes these ornaments or earrings or jewelry were used in pagan worship, and so it's a symbolic gesture of taking off these adornments that might have caused them to worship other things. But probably a majority view is this. It meant basically a humbling of yourself by taking off your adornments or the sort of old or New Testament equivalent, maybe you've heard it, is donning uh, you know, sock cloth and ashes, basically. The idea that I'm going to look really bad, I'm, I'm tearing my robes, I'm looking really humble and just really repentant because I'm just so upset. I'm not bothering to eat or shave or bathe because I'm just falling in repentance before the Lord. That's probably what most scholars think it's meaning. That basically, take off your ornaments means this. And if I were to put it this way, how do we cultivate one of the first, one of two steps we're going to consider? How do we cultivate a greater experience of God's presence? Number one, don't try to look so good spiritually at least. Don't worry about how you look. One of the things we've done, you know, both in Boston, I'm sure you guys have it here, is when we try, you know, this is a large group of people, so it may not always be the pastor, but visiting people in the hospital. You know, trying to go and visit people, pray for them. Sometimes it's a joyful thing. You're visiting a newborn, you know, baby with their parents. It's great. Sometimes it's a little bit more harder, sickness or aging family members, things like that. But, you know, we go. And what I've noticed is, like, I've been in going to hospitals or intensive care units, and I'm going there and as a pastor to visit. And, you know, this person, they've got this, they've got this central line going through. They've got all these sensors on them. They've got all this stuff. They're just really plugged into all these machines that are trying to keep them alive. And they're like, you know, they've got hair shaved. They've got, you know, all just hospital stuff if you've been there. And again, it's, maybe this is a hard memory, or maybe you're going through it now, so, so you can probably relate the idea there. And when I walk into a room, when someone is, all those things plugged into them, here's what Chinese aunties and grandmas do. They say, oh, pastor's here. And they, they start sitting up and straightening out their, their hospital gown that is cut open so that they can have to just start, they start doing this. And I'm like, oh, don't do your hair. It's okay. You're sick. You're here to get better. This is not the time to be concerned about how we look. In fact, it might be odd to focus on how good I look in my dormants if I'm inside unhealthy. Same spiritually, focusing less on how good we look as a person or a family or a church and focusing on the inside. What are our dormants being hum adornments and just understanding, let's take off any ornaments. How are we focused on trying to look good spiritually? It's not about, one of the scariest passages in all the Bible for me is in 2 Timothy where it says this, beware of the appearance of godliness which lacks spiritual power. If you go read 2 Timothy 2, that is a scary passage. As a pastor, as a Christian, there is such a thing as the appearance of godliness that lacks all real spiritual power. And I don't think you have to be a pastor to experience that, to understand that, because we need to understand what is our true spiritual state. But now, besides sort of like focusing, and I know we don't have time to unpack specifically what that looks like in different stages of life and spiritual stages, but that's what maybe small groups are for, discipleship groups, and, but the notion here is, the principle is, take off your ornaments. What turns away God's righteous anger that would consume the people of God when he says, I command you, take off and strip off your ornaments, and then just take it all off because they know there's no point to trying to look good before God because he sees everything through and through and knows us. Let's focus less on what it means 
to look good. And more on what? Let's take a look at the next passage. This is an, another strange and fascinating passage. Beginning in verse 7, this is the whole idea of Moses sometimes would go out to another tent, and he's going to talk to God, and the cloud would come down. It's, let's take a look at verse 7. Join me there. Now, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the camp. So what's happening here? God, they've had this conversation. God strip off your ornaments and they're okay we're doing that. That was sort of a one-time deal. But there's this other practice in the people of God. Whenever Moses wanted to hear from God or anyone wanted to hear from God, they set out this sort of little chapel or this tent to go out there. So if I were to go out there, maybe bring my family or, you know, go with some other brothers, we pray, we try to meet God there. But something strange happened when Moses went. When Moses went, the heavens came down and a cloud descended. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Who's in the bathroom? Oh, one of the pastors. How can you tell? The glory <laughs> of God is upon that bathroom. You know, that's like, that's basically Moses. Pretty, you can always know where Moses is because he's talking to God and the glory of God is there. It's pretty amazing, but that's not the, just the point. The point is when Moses would go and they knew God would condescend and humble himself to speak to a humble, lowly, finite human being, the people were so in awe that God would engage and communicate with us that in reverence, it's, I can imagine maybe they're preparing the food at home and, and like, Daddy, Daddy, or Baba, Baba, you know, let's go. Because Moses is going to the tent, and like maybe everyone's like, come here, son, come here, child. And they go respectfully, reverently, and in awe, and they're looking, and they, they stand at the tent, and Moses is slowly walking here. And just, just imagine the scene, the whole camp. Moses is going to, to the tent. Goes, Moses is going to meet with God, and they're standing in awe, and they're watching Moses make his way all the way to the tent because they wanted to see the God who created them, the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, who delivered them, would come down to descend in the form of a cloud and hover on the tent as long as Moses was there. And Joshua, his, like, his right-hand guy, was so enamored, he's just like, I'm going to stay here because like, the glory of God was here. They are in awe of the simple fact that God would speak to them. And that's the second point. Besides throwing away our ornaments, taking them off, besides the principle of focus less on trying to look good spiritually, the purpose is to cultivate a, a deep awe of God. He is communicating with us. A sense that God actually speaks to us. We need to regain that sense of wonder. Years ago, my wife and I, we were renting an apartment in, in, in the city we live in, just north of Boston called Medford. Uh, our church was partnering, one of our, our global partners in East Asia had an opportunity to really help because um, there are some, of the, some of the best hospitals in the world, just like here, are in Boston. Um, sports teams, there's some great, like amazing hospitals and teaching universities, and including reconstructive surgery. There was a boy from East Asia who had this story. Basically, um, we would work with our global partner who was ministering the area. This boy had a disfigured face. Because when this boy was very, very small to see what would happen, this boy turned on the stove in their house and put on a can of paint on the thing. And it, 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 it yeah, it exploded and burnt. And the wife, the mother feels, it's just, and they're very, very poor. So this global partner of ours had arranged donated surgery from Boston Children's Hospital, reconstructive surgery. And we're not just talking to look a certain way, but to really make all the things try to work better in their eating and talking and stuff like that. So we had the opportunity to host this family this mother and this son. And our son Evan was like three years old. So it was truly neat. Like he, the boy was like five or six. And I still remember. And so they're from East Asia. They were fairly poor. And we sat down and Karen had made dinner. And there was, you know, rice in the center of the table. There was a protein or a meat in the center of the table. And there was like a veggie. Uh, oh, sorry, California. Veg in the center of the table. Vegetable. Um, <laughs> Not avocado, but vegetable. And the mom and the child were just in awe. And we're like, Karen's like, 
is, is everything, is something wrong? And they just didn't do anything. And we're like, you know, and, and my Mandarin is good for a Cantonese church, okay? So, so it was hard to engage with them. And so we're talking, and here's what I gathered. They were in awe that besides rice, we have not just one cai or one non-rice, it's two dishes. That's crazy. You have so much. Well, so, okay, we tried to get them over that. Then the next night, we thought, okay, they, they used to our, you know, extravagant American pastor ways. So Karen, again, had a rice in the middle to share, a protein, a meat, and a veggie. And once again, when we start, after we said grace, they're just staring at us in awe of our incredible American wealth. And I said, what's wrong? You eat different dishes? You had chicken, but this, what, be, you can eat more than one. We just eat the same one dish with rice every day. So I'm just, you know, we're taking this in. I'm like, wow, I'm, I, I, just kind of realizing their awe at the bountiful food. And then, you know what really took the case? You know, we had church on Sunday, and then on our church in that season, Monday is my Sabbath. And so, I, and then, so they came out, and they were talking. Karen told me this story. They said, like, oh, is Pastor Enoch gone or Enoch gone? Like, oh, no, he's sleeping. Like, he's sleeping, but it's like, it's like 10 a.m. in the morning. He's still sleeping. He was pretty busy back then, still is now. But, and like, what's he doing? And Karen said this, oh, it's his day off. You have days off? I remember those stories and having the opportunity to experience that. They were in awe of something that I have long taken for granted. The sheer massive supply chain infrastructure, resources of that, some vegetable from another country on another continent produced by people I will never meet and probably honestly not being paid properly for that anyway can be on my table in a week along with some meat or protein from another part of the world, another part of the country, to be there. Not to mention the sauces and spices or the bowls that it's in and the energy. It's just incredible. To have a meal is incredible awe. This is what God is inviting us whenever we turn to the Word of God. We have so many Bible translations, so many, we have so many apps. And what God is saying this, if you really want to experience God's presence, two things— Take off the ornaments, the invitation and challenge to become humble and say, okay, Lord, I'm not as spiritual as people at church think I am. I'm not as spiritual as guest speaker introductions make me out to be. (laughs) And maybe neither are any of us. And more than that, if I really want to see God's presence, these people understood when God speaks, we need to be recapturing that wonder. And I think if we, if we can, by the grace of God, the Spirit of God working to do that, that's spiritual transformation. You know, pray that that person becomes more patient. That's great. Pray that that person, you know, has a heart to be more generous. That's really important. But pray that this person would become spiritually humble and would crave and be in, captured in wonder and awe that God deigns to speak to mortals like you and me. And if we do that, maybe just maybe God will help us to cultivate more of his presence in our lives. The word of God and the spirit of God in that picture in our lives each and every single day. Because sometimes we wonder if God's with us. Sometimes we question and we say, God, his presence is not here. And maybe the reason that happens sometimes is because we have mistaken God's good blessings for his presence. And if we focus on his presence, one of the, two of the things we can do to cultivate more of that that he's taught us and given us in this passage and in the word is to humble ourselves and to take off our ornaments. Don't look so spiritual. Don't be so concerned about how other people think of us as spiritual people. Rather, cultivate humility and just cultivate a sense of, wow, I'm going to be in wonderment and amazement and awe that God actually speaks to me. And this is spiritual. It's like trying to teach someone that didn't have to swim or steal onto a boat to come to this country so that their children have a better life and then hope that those immigrant kids growing up here in middle-class lives can learn the value of money. It's such an immigrant conundrum paradox. I talk to people at my church, my child, young or even older, doesn't grasp the meaning of money. And and basically, the the way we have to get to is you learn the value of money because you have to flee war or something to come to this country so your kids could have a better, why? So they have a comfortable life. And I said, that's great. And God has given you that dream that your kids can have a comfortable life. But in that comfortable life, it is not 
your experience, you learn the value of money because you went through the difficult life. So by extension, good parenting, you know, I'll let you think about that. But, but here's the notion. We need to come back and go, wow, God speaks. If we can do that individually, as families, and as a church family, what might happen? What would it look like to experience God's presence? This is leading into the third point. What really is it like? Okay, like, let's be honest. Southern Baptist Church. I know you, you, you need permission to lift your hands here, apparently. Only the pastors can do this, but otherwise the worship leader has to allow you to. I'm just kidding. But, but I'm, actually, you weren't all serious. I wasn't sure if you were kidding. So the, like, the notion here is, what is it really? So let me give you my first understanding. What does it really mean to experience the presence of God? Is it mystical? Is it magical? Is it like, woo? So seventh grade, I went to my first church youth retreat. It was not my church. It was a bigger church in the area. All right, and so I'd never been in a youth retreat before, and they had these things. And, you know, if you've ever been to a retreat, especially youth retreats, everything's programmed, so hopefully it's safe and all that stuff and provided for. So we had these little booklets, these little 8 and a half by 11 folded stapled booklets. And in the booklets, every morning was something called a quiet time or daily devotional. Basically, a chance to read the Bible in the morning, and there's a chance to think through some questions, and there's a chance to write in some responses. You got that? Can, does it make sense? Like, oh, there's a booklet with a little bit of prompt to read and think. That's the devotional, okay? So I've never been on a retreat. My parents are Christian, but we never talked about devotions or anything. So I go, okay, cool. Let's see. The calendar, the schedule, 45 minutes for the morning quiet time devotional. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. So I go there. I get my Bible. I get the devotional, and oh, it's so much, it's nice, we're in the mountains, so I'm going to find a nice space, I'll spend a few minutes finding the perfect spot, you know, the spot Jesus would sit, and we go there, and then I take open my Bible, I take open my devotional material, and I open in prayer, I read a little bit, I think a little bit, I come back and I, I read the passage now, trying to read it, savor it, be wise, all that stuff, and then I, there's a few more questions, I take my pencil, and I'm writing the answer to the question, the devotional, and I thought, wow, I got through a devotional. I closed the Bible, closed the booklet, and looked at my watch. Ten minutes had passed. (laughs) Ten minutes to find the the perfect spot to meet Jesus, read the Bible, journal, pray, do intensive study, and answer questions to apply Scripture to my life. And I'm looking around, and there's there's this teenage high school girl, a few years older than me, like a high school girl. She's just sitting still with the most enwrapped face. Like she's like just watching the best movie. Ever. Just, just like talking. I was like, wow. Okay, well, since I got 35 more minutes, let me do this again. <laughs> so I took open my Bible, took, I opened it again. I, 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 I read the introduction again, and maybe I missed something. I'm thinking, read the thing. Okay, and then it says, read the passage. I read the passage again. I read it twice. And I go back, and there's a journal. Thing. What does Jesus mean? What did this side must I write this stuff down? How much? I wrote it down. Okay, I, I did the devotional twice. Closed it, closed it. Only five minutes had passed. <laughs> and I look over at that girl, the high school girl, the one that's so spiritual. I kid you, she's weeping. <laughs> there are tears coming from her eyes. I'm like, is it that spot? What is it? So, okay, all right. So I go open my Bible, open the devotional, and this was like Saturday morning. We were there till like, we were there many more days. I literally read like all the devotionals for the whole week we were supposed to be there. Read all those things, answered every question. Like, just did it all. Very spiritual. Closed it, and I'm thinking, okay, only like 10 minutes had passed, and I look over her. She's floating above the ground. She's so unwrapped. I'm just kidding. She's not floating. But the point is, as I think about this, like, like, what does it mean? This, this language of experiencing God's presence is so namby pan It's like so touchy-feely, smushy. Like, what is that? Is, that? is that crying during singing, during worship time? Is it like, I don't know, just really beating your breast as you're... What is that? What does it feel like? And maybe, like, if someone says, you just feel it, I'm like, well, that doesn't help me, okay? Like... <sighs> I'm an awkward, inhibited Chinese-American male, so I need more than that. And so this passage, I believe, helps us understand very concretely what it means to experience God's presence. So let me just unpack this a little bit. Um, Well, let's read the passage and then try to orient us here. So let's go back, and this is in this fantastic section, beginning of verse 12. We're going to kind of go through the rest of the section. Verse 12 says this. Moses is bargaining with God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, 
bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please now show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And this is where we get the point of the passage. And he said, my presence will go with you. Really important. That was point one. He can send you his blessings and send you off, but he doesn't have to send his blessing, his presence. His presence will go with you. But now Moses, he's on a roll. It's like, well, I just got, God just graciously gave me his presence. What else can I get? Okay, verse, let's go. Verse 15. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And verse 18, he's going for it. Moses said, please show me your glory, whatever in the world that means. What does that mean? I mean, Moses is like, just God, just show me your glory. And God's like, whoa, okay. So verse 19, and he said, and I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And behold, the Lord said, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand as it were until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my fa- back, but my face shall not be seen. Scholars call this an anthropomorphism. When he says hand and covering my back, it's not really God's back. It's like when Jesus says, I will cover you under my shadow, my wing, he's not a chicken. So he's saying this is kind of image that finite humans can understand. What is going on here? He says, show me your glory. And God says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. So what was that all about? And then what's really weird is you think good is like kind and gentle, but he says goodness, and then he says this, and this is what a good God is. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And if I don't want to show the mercy, I don't show the mercy. You know what? That's odd. That doesn't sound good to me. I thought good people just show mercy all the time to everyone. What's going on here? Here's what I think. Let me just unpack it with words and try to illustrate it. But here's what I think in this passage is teaching us about experiencing God. Experiencing God is a deeper appreciation of an attribute of God. Experiencing God more is to be captured by a deeper revelation of the character of God in some way. And for Moses, who had just disobeyed him, who God does not, he's not obligated to forgive Moses. He's not obligated to kind of let them have his blessings. He said, I am good, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, and you will know, Moses, through my glory, a deeper experience of my goodness. That's what it means for Moses to see the glory of God. My mom has had issues with health over many years. She worships over in Torrance, California at our church there, church I went to in college and seminary. And basically, there's a lot of people there. And so she shares with her small group her health issues and things. So she was telling me over the phone one day years ago that there's this world famous medical expert at UCLA Medical Center. It's got like a year long wait list to see this one this guy, this one doctor, this is like super, so she's, she's asking people to pray that I can go see this specialist, super, super duper, world famous, world renowned, super expert specialist, all these things. So months and months go by and finally it's her time. I know about it because she's telling me I'm seeing that specialist. The specialist you booked back in the 80s, yes, that guy. So I might be able to see this specialist. She's waiting there in her hospital gown, kind of waiting to see this specialist. She's been waiting for like so long to see. And she's sitting there, she hears her name, Belle. Belle, is that you? And she goes, wait, I know that boy. She turns, it's so-and-so brother from church. And he's, he's, she's, like, she's like, what are you doing here? She's like, I've been waiting forever to see this world-renowned medical specialist for my issue. And he goes, well, who's that? He's like, well, Dr. So-and-so. And he's like, well, Belle, that's me. <laughs> you could have asked me a small group. <laughs> the point is, she's always known this brother's a doctor. She's always known he's a good doctor. She's always known he's actually a pretty sought-after doctor. But she more deeply appreciated who this brother is now because she had a deeper understanding, experience, and appreciation 
of who he is. One of my teenage girls who grew up in our church, in our youth group, went to college, went to Boston University, was going to apply for, you know, standard Chinese American program, PhD, MD, no big deal. So she was applying for that, and she asked me to write the essay for her entrance, you know, for her application. Now, I've written applications for PhD programs, and I've written recommendations for MD programs. I have to admit, I've never written an application until hers a recommendation for MD, PhD. I was like, medical doctor, P do I write it twice as long? I don't know. So anyway, I wrote it and all this stuff like that. And so eight years later, she's done with everything. And so at one point, we got to go to her oral defense. This is a sister from church, a little girl that I saw grow up. We go there, and I go with her husband and a few other people. We're watching this, and we walk in, and she's wearing the robes of higher education, her clerical robes, her white medical science gown. And she's standing there, and it's like she's talking about CSF for like an hour, cerebral spinal fluid, and for like, and some of you are nodding, God bless you. And there's all this sort of thing. And then at the end of this hour lecture on cerebral spinal fluid with all sorts of pictures and everything, she gives, you know, because it's not just the oral defense, it's actually, you know, a, a ceremony. She's saying, I'd like to thank people like our church, uh, my husband, and I have some friends in the back who probably only understood like, you know, like, 5% of what I said, you know, thank you for being here. And I was offended. <laughs> I understood like 10% of like what she was saying. And I knew she was smart. I knew she was smart. But then I realized, wow, she's smart. One more story for you old timers. I moved into my first dormitory at UCLA in the fall of 1993. And if you were around in that time, and you know UCLA, if you live in Southern California, you move in, this is what it's like. You go on a Thursday, move in, and you go back home. And you eat at home, and you, <laughs> especially first year, food's better. So anyway, I remember being at home in Palos Verdes in 1993 fall, and I remember in the morning on Saturday thinking, who is shaking my bed? And what is this sound? What is this, why is there an alarm rumbling? What's this? And I look around, and I, it's not my bed is shaking, my room is shaking. It's odd. Not only is my room shaking, the walls of my room are shaking. And I look out my window, overlooking the ocean, because as Paul's Verde is bougie, and, and, and I see literally the, the house is shaking. And I literally see the, the hills are shaking. This is, and I, I kind of realize this is the biggest earthquake we now know as the Northridge earthquake. This is the biggest earthquake I've ever thus lived through. And I, I, I tell you, I just woke up, I was so groggy, I have no idea why I did this, but as I realized this is an earthquake, and it's not sound coming from somewhere. In an earthquake like that, the sound is everywhere. Massive thundering, deafening, rumbling of everything. And in the midst of that, I don't know why, but I crumpled up as a ball and said, God, you're so awesome. Because <laughs> I think in that moment, I realized, oh, I'm small. You know when you're reading the Bible, it's a passage you've always seen, and all of a sudden, like one of the Wesleys says in their journal, the Wesley theologians, all of a sudden the love of God jumps out. And you're like, oh, I've always heard this. God, God is loving. Or you're singing a song for a church or worship or on your own, and there's a line you've always known about his forgiveness. But recently you've really, you've committed sins that you didn't think you'd ever commit. And you're, you're wrestling with applying the theology that you've been well taught that God does forgive, and all of a sudden, now I'm understanding a little better when it says God is a forgiving God. Or when you realize as your kid's growing up and you can't control them, now I know what it means where it says God is the only one who can change hearts. I cannot change any heart, no matter how desperate I am to change my spouse or my child or myself. Friends, what does it mean to experience God? In this passage, it means you come away saying, God is more holy than I thought. God is more powerful than I thought. God is more loving than I thought. God is more gentle than I thought. God is, for, God is more majestic. And that is what it means to experience God's presence. Because sometimes we wonder if God's with us. Is God really there? And perhaps in those times, it's helpful to do a heart check. Say, under the power of the Spirit, am I feeling like God's not with me because I have mistaken his blessings and prayed for his blessings a lot more and I'm seeking his blessings more than his presence? Because if so, then maybe it's time to turn to God once again and say, God, help me. Have I put on some ornaments without realizing? Am I like doing my spiritual makeup to look better? Well, God, help me to take off my ornaments. Help me to recognize that I should just be in awe of your word so that I can have a deeper experience of part of your character. You are good. You are powerful. You are holy. You are my Savior. Friends, that's 
I think, what this passage means, to experience God's presence. And if you do that, if we do that, perhaps you will experience more. As one writer put this way, when it comes to asking God, because this all began with, what do I want from God? What blessings do I ask? One guy, Oswald Chambers, says this, ask God for what you want. Ask God for what you want, and do not be concerned about asking for the wrong thing, because as you draw ever closer to God, you will cease asking for things altogether. Let's pray. Gracious Father, help us to understand and be challenged. Your blessings are good, and you are generous and kind, and we should not issue them or take them lightly. You are a generous God. But more than a generous God, more than your gifts, what sets your people apart is not a nice building, not cars that are filling the parking lot, not a really big children's program. Those are all good. But what really sets a people apart as the people of God is the presence of God. So Lord, I pray your presence would fill us. I pray that we would seek your word to know you, who you are, and that this church, everyone here, we would all have a deeper sense of some part. Lord, some of us desperately need to grow in our sense that you are so powerful. We just really need that in our lives. Lord, some of us need to be challenged that you are a holy God. We've been rationalizing some sins or some unhealthy patterns. We've just been God's... No, we need to be seen like Isaiah. You are majestic in in holiness. Some of us desperately need to know that you are the gentle God that comes and seeks the lost sheep. Lord, help us so that we may know more of who you are. Experience your presence so that we may truly bring you all the glory that you so rightly deserve. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.